Okay, there are handouts in the back if you're coming in and uh, want to pick one up. Uh, they uh, may be helpful to you uh, as we go through the study this morning. As always, it's uh, unlikely we'll be able to cover everything that is there. Uh, we are in Acts chapter 20 uh, this morning, and uh, we're trying to get through uh, our study of this book. And uh, we, when you get to Acts chapter 20, you are on Paul's third missionary journey. And uh, I think it's important to be able to place uh, all of these events uh, so that when you pick up your Bible, you can say, okay, here's Acts 20, what's going on? Uh, Paul's already been on his first journey, he's already been on his second journey. And uh, back in chapter 18, verse 23, he started on his third missionary journey. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we looked at Acts chapter 19, and uh, we saw that uh, that's a, uh, 41 verses of a chapter where Paul spent three years in the city of Ephesus, uh, longer than he spent uh, anywhere else. Uh, and that's uh, the major part of this third missionary journey is, are those years that he spent in the city of Ephesus. Uh, and you get, chap you get to Acts chapter 20 in verse 1, and it says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. What was that uproar all about? If you just start reading in chapter 20, you read about after the uproar had ceased. What was the uproar? Well, go back to chapter 19. What happened at the end of Acts chapter 19? Paul's in the city of Ephesus. While Paul is in the city of Ephesus, um, he uh, uh, look in chapter 19, verse 21. Uh, Paul purposed in the spirit that he was eventually uh, going to make his way to Rome. You get down to verse 23. About that time, Acts 19, verse 23. About that time, there arose a great commotion about what? The way. What's that? A great commotion about the way. What, what do you notice about the word way in your Bible? Capitalized. How often do you capitalize the word way? Why is it being capitalized? Go back up to verse... Uh, uh, 10. Is it verse 10 or verse 9? There were some who were hardened and did not believe uh, when Paul was speaking in the synagogue for three months, uh, but they spoke evil of what? The way. Go back to chapter 9. We, we've seen this expression a number of times in this book. Go back to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, Saul, uh, as he was known back then before he was Paul the Apostle, Chapter 9 and verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest. He asked for letters from the high priest to go to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way. It's found frequently in this book. What is this talking about? Why is it that, that when you get over to chapter 19 and verse 23, that there was a great commotion that arose about the way. What was Paul looking for in Acts 9? What was Saul looking for in Acts 9? Christians. To find anyone who was of the way, of the church. How many, how many ways does God have? There's just one, the way. How many churches, how many kingdoms, how many plans, how many schemes to save man? Does he, he just has one. How many bodies of people on this earth does he have? Just one. And they were very identifiable. Paul was going to Damascus to find those who were of the way. How was he going to find them? They were identifiable. They could be, uh, uh, they could be found and, uh, and known who they were. Well, you get to chapter 19. Paul's been in this city uh, for about three years. There were a number of individuals uh, who had become Christians in the city of Ephesus. Uh, and what had transpired just prior to this uh, is that many Christians, you go back up to verse 19, chapter 19, verse 19, there were uh, many, well, verse 18, many who had believed, they were Christians, came confessing and telling their deeds. There were some Christians who realized that some things that they were still doing were wrong, and they came, in verse 19, many of those who practiced magic, Sorcery brought their books together, their magic books, um, 
they brought them together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted up the value of these books and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, about 35 grand uh, in our, uh, in our uh, currency today. The books totaled $35,000 that they burned. Uh, and so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. What's happening? Uh, the gospel is not just being taught. The gospel is having an impact in the lives of people. Uh, and so the word of the Lord grew mightily. It prevailed. It's spreading throughout the city of, uh, of Ephesus. And so that's when you get to verse 23. In verse 23 it says, There arose a great commotion about the way. What was uh, this stirring, this trouble, uh, this commotion? Well, we won't go through everything here in chapter 19 because we're supposed to be looking at chapter 20 today. But uh, we'll get there. There was a certain man named Demetrius in verse 24. He's a silversmith. What did he do as a silversmith? He made, he made idols. He made silver shrines to the goddess Diana. And he brought no small, uh, no small profit to the craftsmen. There were, a, uh, there were a group of craftsmen who it, it, was, their, it was their job. that they were, they were a part of the tourism industry. Um, when, you, uh, when you go to Washington, D.C., can you buy a Washington monument? Sure you can. Not, not the 500, what is it, 555 feet. Not that, you know, you're not going to fit that in your trunk. But can you buy a Washington monument? Yeah, a little dude like that. Can, can, what are these people doing? Are they, are they selling... Are they selling uh, the temple of Diana? Are they selling the goddess Diana? Well, sure, in a, you know, in a little pocket edition that everybody can take home with them. Would Christianity offer any kind of a threat to them, to their craft, to their industry, to their religion? There arose a great commotion about the way uh, because uh, Paul's going to put us out of business this guy's here, and here even these Christians are coming and burning their magic books when they realize they're not supposed to be doing that. And so uh, in verse 25, um, Demetrius called a union meeting. He called all of his craftsmen together. And he said, guys, we got a problem here. Uh, you know that we have our prosperity by this, parade, by this trade. Moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, guys, this is not a problem just here. But throughout almost all Asia, this word is spreading. Go back to verse 10. Uh, as Paul was there in the city of Ephesus for two years, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. The Bible not only states that as a fact in verse 10 that the word of the Lord was spreading, Demetrius knew it was happening. Over in verse 26, guys, you know that this is happening. Uh, and uh, this Paul, verse 26, has persuaded and turned many people saying that there are not gods which are made with hands. That's a problem to them because what are they doing? They're making gods with their hands. And what's Paul preaching? There's not any gods made with hands. There's only one God. And so they, uh, he says in verse 27, not only, is our, uh, not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but guys, it's bigger than that. He, he's really trying to to, uh, to win their hearts to his cause. Not only are we going to be put out of our job, uh, but he says, the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed. She's being worshipped throughout the whole world. It falls upon us, in other words, to do something. It falls upon us to save the great goddess Diana. So verse 28, when they heard this, they were full of wrath and they cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Verse 29, the whole city was filled with what? Confusion. Why were they filled with confusion? Well, we're going to get to it. They rushed into the city with one accord, into the theater with one accord. They seized Paul's travel companions, brought them in to persecute them. I'm going to pause there for just a minute. Ruth, you had your hand up. Yeah, that's his main problem is, is, is his money. 
He said at verse, the end of verse 24, he brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Uh, and then he said in verse uh, 25, you know, we have our prosperity by this. Tree. That's his main problem. I think he's trying to win their hearts a little bit by saying, hey, you know, we got a bigger deal here. It's, it's about the goddess Diana. But it, what's really tugging at his heart is his wallet. Uh, does that happen sometimes? Is there, a, is there a, a connection between somebody's heart and their wallet sometimes? And here was Paul. Paul was having an impact on his wallet and that was tugging at his heart to say, hey, we got to do something about this because uh, we got some problems. I think it's interesting that verse 23 says there was a great commotion. There's a great commotion in the city about the way, about the word of God, about the, the impact of the gospel of Christ. Verse 29 says the city was filled with confusion. Drop down to verse 32. Therefore, uh, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. These people who had rushed into the theater were confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Most of them. Here, here, was, a, here was a theater uh, that, uh, I, I, that archaeologists have discovered and uh, estimated that it could have, this theater could have, could have fit 25,000 people in the theater. Most of the people in this theater, they didn't know why they were there. They were just following the crowd. And yet, what are they doing? They're opposing Paul. They're opposing the gospel. They're opposing what's going Why are they doing it? Oh, they don't know. <laughs> Everybody else is doing it. So they're just going along with it. When I was reading this, it just reminded me of America. I don't know why. You know, there's some people in our country that are just going along with those who have the loudest voices. And they just say, well, you know, that, that's, everybody else is saying that. It, it, let's, just, let's just follow that. And I wonder if we were to gather people together in a theater and ask them why they oppose Christianity if they could articulate a reason. Well, they don't even know what they're doing. Great commotion. There's confusion. They're gathered. They don't even know why they're there. But everybody else is against Paul, so hey, let's be against Paul. I don't know that we need to, um, that we need to believe that, uh, that this nation is as far gone against Christianity as some make it out to be. Because some folks don't even know what they believe and why they believe it. Isn't that an opportunity for the gospel? If some people don't know why they believe, what they believe and why they believe it, isn't that an opening for the gospel for these people? Why was the gospel having such an impact in the city of Ephesus? Because you got a lot of people like this. And when they, see that, when they find the truth, uh, they, they actually are going to follow it. All right, we, we got to get to uh, chapter 20. Go to verse 34. But that's in chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 34. When they found out uh, that Alexander was a Jew, they cried out with one voice for two hours. Here's the, here's the mind-numbed people who are just going, and for two hours, great is the Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians. For, could you say that for two hours? That's what they're doing for two hours. You know what we need, verse 35, what we need today are, are more city clerks. What we need today, and whether it be a city clerk or whether it be a business owner or whether it be just an average citizen, we just need some people who will stand up and speak reason. That's all the city clerk did. Of course, he had authority, and so he could, at the end of this chapter, dismiss the assembly and say, get out of here, guys. But all the city clerk did is he, just spoke, he stood up and he spoke reason. He said, guys, you know the power, you know the influence of the goddess Diana. And basically... If, if that influence is going to continue, who can stop it? But if Paul and his company, uh, if, if, they're, if they're going to do their thing, just let them do their thing. But let's drop down to verse 40. Look at what the city clerk says. We are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar. The word literally means, the word uproar literally is insurrection. 
Here were some people that gathered together in an insurrection, uproar, confusion, commotion about the way. And he says, there is no reason which may, that we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. You have all of these groups today who want to oppose Christianity. What reason do they have to oppose Christianity? Oh, they'll try to make one up. They'll try to say, you know, separation of church and state or something like that, and yet that's not even in the Constitution. But yet that's a, that's a common phrase today. Dirk? Yeah, it, it, sounds, uh, it sounds very much um, like, what, uh, like what transpired um, uh, prior uh, in this book. Uh, when, uh, when the council had gathered together and they, they wanted to bring all sorts of trouble uh, against God's people. And back in Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel uh, gave similar advice. Uh, but, you know, Gamaliel's advice was even, even sharper for the cause of God that said, look, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 39, if this is of God, you can't do anything about it. You can't overthrow it. Uh, you can't fight against God. That's, that's uh, similar, uh, although uh, the city clerk is citing you know, more with just the, the orderliness of what needed to transpire here, at least there were some people who spoke reason. So he dismissed the assembly. All right, come to chapter 20. That's where we are. At chapter 20 begins after the uproar had ceased. The uproar of chapter 19. This riot that was beginning in chapter 19. After the uproar had ceased, Paul left the city of Ephesus. We won't take any more time to talk about the city of Ephesus, but on your, uh, but on your handout, you have a number of things that, that help us to see that uh, the church at Ephesus had become a very strong and influential church, uh, and for a lot of reasons. And uh, as you read through the rest of the New Testament and on uh, into the, uh, the first couple centuries of Christianity, this was, a, this was a congregation that was going to play a key role uh, in, in the work of the church. We've seen Antioch is having a very mission-minded uh, effort and uh, Ephesus was going to become uh, very much a hub of Christianity. Go down to uh, Roman, numeral number, or Roman numeral one, letter B on the front of your handout. Paul left Ephesus. At the end of chapter 20 and verse 1, it says that he traveled through Macedonia. And uh, the, the book of Acts is not an exhaustive account of everything that transpired we, because all we see in chapter 20 verse 1 is he goes from point Ephesus to go over to point Macedonia. Um, but if you read the rest of the New Testament, you'll see that in, in this time between uh, Ephesus and Macedonia, Paul was anxiously awaiting uh, the return of Titus to him. Interesting, when you read the book of Acts, you don't read Titus. You don't read about Titus at all. You don't see Titus' name uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, but uh, you have on your handout 2 Corinthians chapter 2 uh, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, what you find in, when you read the book of 2 Corinthians is that when Paul left Ephesus, he traveled to Troas because he was supposed to meet Titus in Troas. The reason he was supposed to meet him there is because he had dispatched Titus to go to Corinth to find out how his first letter had been received, the first letter to Corinth. Uh, you've read 1 Corinthians. Is 1 Corinthians filled with a lot of warm fuzzies and, uh, and pleasantries and uh, kindnesses, uh, or is it filled with a lot of finger-pointing and sharp tone and change this and get this right? Uh, it's more the latter than the, than the former. Uh, it was a very strongly worded letter about some things they needed to do. Paul was concerned about how that letter was being received by the brethren. So he had sent Titus to find out, and he was anxiously waiting for the report to come back from Titus. He went to Troas. Titus didn't find him in, uh, uh, or Paul didn't find Titus in Troas, so he left Troas and uh, made his way to Macedonia, which is what we're seeing in chapter 20 and verse 1. And it's while he's in Macedonia that he meets up with Titus. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 
he gets a report from Titus uh, that uh, the letter is being received well. And so here in chapter 20 and verse 1, when he gets to Macedonia, this is the time when he writes 2 Corinthians. He just got word back from Titus about how 1 Corinthians was received. And so he sits down and writes 2 Corinthians. When you read 2 Corinthians, it has very much a different tone than 1 Corinthians. Uh, it, it is a letter that is filled more with comfort, uh, with, is filled more with assurance uh, and thanksgiving um, for, the, for those things that they had received. Now verse 2, when they had gone over the region of Macedonia uh, and encouraged the brethren there, he came to Greece, uh, likely even down into the city of Corinth, and he stayed there for three months. Now, while he is in Greece, there for three months, this is about the time that he writes uh, the book of Romans. So he's written 2 Corinthians, uh, and now and while he's in Corinth, is about the time that he's writing the book of Romans. Uh, you might read the last half of Romans chapter 15 um, sometime, because in the last half of Romans 15, Paul's, if you put it in the context of what's happening here in chapter 20, Paul says in Romans chapter 15, I am making my way to Jerusalem, which is what he's doing. That's where he's going to go at the end of this journey. I'm making my way to Jerusalem, but after I go to Jerusalem, I have plans to go to Spain. And when I go to Spain, he tells the church in Rome, I'm going to come and see you as well. And so Paul had plans. Uh, go, back to chapter, uh, uh, go back to chapter 19. Uh, go back to chapter 19, verse 21. Chapter 19, verse 21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, he had purposed to go to Jerusalem. That's where he was headed, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Well, you read Romans 15, which is what he wrote in Acts 20 and verse 2. And he tells city in Rome, I'm coming to see you as well as going to Spain. What he also tells them, and you have this on your handout in letter B, I think number one under letter B is that while Paul was making this third missionary journey, he is also collecting uh, benevolent funds for the poor saints uh, that were in Jerusalem and surrounding Jerusalem. And so when you read Romans 15, that's what he tells them. He tells them uh, that he's collecting these funds. When you read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, uh, when he's talking about, let there be no collections when I come. That part of their giving on the first day of the week was for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Uh, and he, uh, he wanted that ready uh, when he got there. Now back to chapter, Acts chapter 20. Jews plotted against him in Corinth, the end of verse 2. So uh, he was about to sail to Syria, but instead uh, he decided to go by foot and return through Macedonia. So he traveled north out of Corinth to go back up through Macedonia Picked up several travel companions with him in verse 4. Um, by the way, uh, Jerry and Lorena Pittman are now grandparents, but their little granddaughter was not named Sopater or Aristarchus or Secundus or Gaius. I don't know why, Tychicus, Trophimus. Those are names free. I don't know anybody named that. Uh, I mean, if, if you want a unique name, there's, there's like a half a dozen of them right there in verse 4. Uh, but uh, little Mia was born. We'll announce that again. Little Mia was born on Friday night. Um, but he picks up all of these travel companions. Verse 5, these men going ahead, remember they were in Macedonia, uh, they went ahead of Paul and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed. He also picks up Luke. And uh, this is likely, and that's obvious by the plural pronouns us and we. Luke, Luke is the one writing this. Um, it has been the pronoun they for several chapters here, but now it's, uh, now it's back to us and we. And uh, the last time we read about Luke being with him uh, was when Luke stayed in Philippi. And uh, the rest of the, Paul and his company had continued on in the second journey. And uh, now it's likely, because he had gone through Macedonia, that he had picked up Luke and Philippi again. Verse 6, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Uh, it's just kind of a time marker so that we know the time of year. And, and in five days, we joined that company who had gone ahead of us. We joined them at Troas. Now that sailing from Philippi to Troas, uh, back in chapter 16, that only took them two days. 
This time it takes them five days to make that same journey. And five days joined them in Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So you get to chapter 20 and verse 6. And as Paul is, uh, as Paul is making his way to Jerusalem, uh, his desire is to get to Jerusalem. Look down in verse uh, 12, I think. No, verse 16. Chapter 20, verse 16. Uh, Paul, we'll see this next week, Paul decided to sail past Ephesus uh, so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. Why? Because he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, Paul is not going there to celebrate as a Jew the Jewish feast of Pentecost. He is going there uh, because this, uh, this would be a time where there would be a number of people who were gathered together, uh, probably even a, a million or two million people in the city of Jerusalem gathered together for this feast, which would be a, a great time to, uh, to have a ready audience for the gospel. So that's what he's trying to do. So he's trying to get to Jerusalem. Verse 16 says that he was hurrying to get to Jerusalem. That's interesting in verse 6. If you're hurrying to get somewhere, why do you stay in a place for seven days? If you're in a hurry, why are you going to hang out uh, in a certain location uh, for a week? Well, what does verse 7 say? Uh, you may have in your Bible, you may have a, uh, a uh, paragraph heading. You may have verses 1 through 6 as one paragraph and then you may have from verses 7 through 12, maybe you have that as a different paragraph. So in your Bible, there may be a disconnect, at least in space. You may have a disconnect between verse 6 and verse 7. But in, in, in the Bible, there's no disconnect. It, it needs to flow right in. He stayed in Troas for seven days. And what does the very next statement say? Now on the first day of the week. Is there any connection between the seven days that he stayed and now on the first day of the week? Does the Bible, does the Bible put any details in here that are not important for us to know? Why did he stay there seven days? What, what difference does it make how long he stayed there? What if it was four or five or six or ten or eleven? Who cares? God cared enough to say he was there for seven days. Okay, so does it matter? Maybe he got there on Tuesday and he left the next Tuesday. That's seven days. Maybe he got there on Thursday, left the next, the next Thursday. That's seven days. Why does it tell us? Because verse 7 says that the first day of the week came. Why was that important? Although he was in a hurry, on the first day of the week... When the disciples came together to break bread. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 is a significant verse uh, strategically placed in the Bible that we need to know about this verse. We need to know what it teaches. Uh, we need to know um, what information God is sharing with us in this verse. You have on your handout that this idea that they were gathered together and we're going to see this again on the back of your handout, we're gathered together is in the passive voice. What does that mean, if it's in the passive voice? Uh, it could be in the active voice. That's another option in the Greek language. Uh, obviously, if it's in the active voice, that means somebody is, there is a person who is acting and doing the acting on behalf of themselves. Um, if, 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 if there is a sentence that says, uh, Bob hit Bill. Well, what's Bob doing? Is Bob passive in that sentence? No, Bill is passive in that sentence. But who, what is Bob doing? He's the active one. He's taking action. Well, these people were gathering together. Aren't, doesn't that mean they're taking action? Yes, they are taking action. So why is it in the passive voice and not active? Why is it not active that they gathered together? It's interesting that it's passive. What does that indicate? It indicates that they were not doing this of their own accord. They were not gathering together because they thought, hey, 
First day of the week, why don't we get together? First day of the week was not a holiday for them. It was not a day off uh, for them. Why would they be getting together? In the passive voice, it indicates that they were getting together because there was some outside directive that had commanded them to get together. Now, where'd that come from? Here's a div- here is a divine decree that had been given for them to gather together. And in the passive voice, it says they were gathering because that is what they were told to do. They gathered together to do what? Do you have the word to in your Bible? First day of the week, when the disciples came together, to break bread. We have them in English. They have them in the Greek language. Uh, some some, uh, uh, some uh, verbs are uh, some verbs are imperatives. They're commands. It's a verb that says do this. It's a command. There are some verbs uh, that are action verbs. Here's a verb that is an infinitive. They gathered together to break bread. The word to indicates this was their purpose. Why did they come together? Did they come together to, uh, to talk about yesterday's games? Did they come together to, uh, to see who was in need? Did they come together to, uh, to share their stories about what had transpired over the last week? Why did they come together? The reason, the purpose that God gives that they came together in this verse, they came together to break bread. That's why. That was their purpose. Now go to the back of your handout and everything on the back of your handout, all of the significant truths on the second side of your handout, all of them have to do with chapter 20, verse 7, just this first part of it. There's a lot that we need to learn uh, and take from, from this passage. First of all, is an understanding that the Lord authorized the first day of the week as His day of worship. That's what we learned from Acts 20, verse 7. They gathered together. When? Why does it tell us what day they gathered together? What difference does it make? Verse 20 could say, Now the disciples were gathered together to break bread. It could say that. Why tell us what day it is? Does it matter? I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about, uh, this, was, this, was a year, this was about the year 53, 54 A.D. So we're, we're, come, we're, we're, what, 1900 and, if it's 54 A.D., what is that, 1940 years ago? Somebody, somebody can figure that out. So we're talking about 1940 years ago. Who cares what day of the week it was? I mean, it, when you look back at things in your life, well, this, this, happened, this happened 20 years ago. Does it matter what day of the week it was if it happened 20 years ago? I mean, it, just the very fact you remember that something happened, isn't that good enough? Isn't, you know, I remember that this happened. What difference does it make what day of the week it is? Why does God tell us what day of the week it was? Because to God, it made a difference. He didn't put that in there just so, oh, well, you know, we just want you to know it was on Sunday. What day of the week had this church gathered together as as a command from God? Does the first day of the week have significance? Look at that list of, what is it, ten things uh, on uh, Roman number number two, letter A, number three on your handout. The supreme significance of the first day of the week in the New Testament. It was the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. It was the day that Jesus first met with his friends and loved ones after he was raised. It was the day that Jesus was first worshipped after he was raised. It was the day that the early disciples were already meeting together from the very start after his resurrection. It was the day the church was established. It was the day that we see here the church in Troas was meeting. It was the day that regular contributions were being made into the treasury in the city of Corinth. It was the day that the early church met every week. The word every is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's the day that became known as the Lord's Day. How significant to God was the first day of the week. He pinpointed this day as the authorized day that he wanted man to worship God. Now, what purpose did he give? 
Did God give a purpose? They came together to break bread. We don't have time to discuss that, that idiom of breaking bread, that, but that was a way that they talked about eating a meal. And sometimes, sometimes that was used to talk about eating a common meal. Look down in verse 11, just to note this, and then we're, going, we're only going to note this, we won't uh, detail this. Look in chapter 20 and verse 11. Now when Paul had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. What's interesting in verses 10 and 11 is that all of the verbs in verses 10 and 11, you have this on the front of your handout, all of the verbs in verses 10 and 11 are third person singular. Everything that happens in verses 10 and 11 is what Paul is doing. All of the actions, all of the verbs in verses 10 and 11 are things that Paul, singular, is doing, including verse 11, when he had come up, he broke bread, he ate, and he talked in verse 11. Now, he broke bread. That's just an idiom that talks about eating a meal. On this occasion in verse 11, it's just a common meal. And as far as we know, he's the only one who ate. The word that's used there for eaten uh, is a word that just means taste. And it's, a word, it's not a word that was ever used for the Lord's Supper anywhere in the New Testament. Common meal. But verse 7 uses that expression, to break bread. And he uses that to talk about the Lord's Supper. For just a moment, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll have to close out with some of this. And this will, uh, this will coincide uh, with, with letter B and letter C on the back of your handout. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Paul was giving instructions to them. And you will find about uh, five times in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this expression, you come together. You see it in verse 17. You come together in verse 18. You come together in verse 20. And then twice at the end of the chapter, verse 33 and 34, you come together, you come together. What is this talking about? Same expression over in Acts 20, verse 7. The disciples were coming together. They were gathering together. Paul was not pleased with them in Corinth because he says in verse 17, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. You're coming together as a church in verse 18. This was a common assembly that they were having, but it was not being done properly because what does he say in verse 20? Because when you come together in one place... It is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What was wrong with what they were doing? He says in verse 17, I don't praise you in this. What's wrong with what they're doing? Are they coming together? Yes. What's the problem? They are not coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. Flip that around then. Why should they have been coming together? What was their purpose in coming together? Their purpose in coming together was to break bread. To partake of the Lord's Supper. And you take 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You take Acts chapter 20. And you take 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And what do we learn? When when you gather scripture together, what do we learn? God authorized first day of the week as his day of worship. God specified that the purpose of first day of the week worship was to partake of the Lord's Supper. How often was the church to gather together to worship, to partake of the Lord's Supper? Every first day of the week. How often does the church gather together? Every first day of the week. So how often should the church be having the Lord's Supper? This isn't up to us to decide. Scripture's already decided it for us. We gather together every first day of the week like we have today. And we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Not because that's a good idea for us but because that's how it's been specified for us in Scripture. Hope this has been helpful for us. We'll pick up, uh, we'll pick up here next week and finish, we'll finish the, second mission, or the third missionary journey next week.